So um, let's see. Uh, normally, we kind of run through our GitHub board, um, and that's what I plan to do. Uh, but we also, since folks were away over the weekend and we had been running the testnet and a bunch of things happened over the weekend, I just want to kind of recap those uh, and uh, talk through them uh, and then have a plan to you know figure out which issues we want to tackle in what sequence. Um, so maybe I'll just go through a quick summary of that first um, and then we'll run through the board. So with that, let me share my screen. And I apologize, some of these docs are internal. And so community members who are on this call, you will not be able to access these docs just yet. As we go through a few iterations of these, we'll uh, figure out um, you know, what parts of the agendas and what communication channels make sense for what kind of discussions. So for now, please bear with us. Um, okay, so quick recap. Um, uh, on Thursday night around 9 p.m. Eastern, um, I think Ludo restarted um, the Neon Miner um, and, and thereby also reset the Stacks chain. So from Thursday night uh, until about Saturday morning, things, things seems to have been working fine. Um, I think block production, at least when I checked, was slower than expected. So ideally, we would see around two blocks a minute. Um, the number, so, you know, between or ideally again, like we should see like 120 blocks uh, per hour. Uh, when I checked, I think we were averaging somewhere between maybe 70 and 90 blocks um, an hour. I mean, maybe there are sort of well understood issues there, but I think Ludo had made a comment that maybe we should investigate this um, further. So, so things went fine around 11 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, starting around 11, 10 a.m. Eastern on Saturday, um, there were no new blocks produced. Um, I'm not sure if we have reached a firm conclusion as to why, but at least that happened. Then later that day around 6 p.m., um, Jay Wiley restarted FluentD because FluentD was maybe consuming too much CPU. Unfortunately, this restarted everything else as well because we have this dependency right now in the Neon setup and that services that rely on Fluentd. If you restart Fluentd, it triggers the restart of everything else. So this was sort of an unplanned and unscheduled restart of the miner, and I'm presumably it also reset the chain. I don't know if uh, it's unclear to me, at least looking at what happened next, whether this restart did anything, um, if it just threw a little bit more confusion in the mix, but the hypothesis was there were some issues due to hype CPU usage on Fluentd. We restarted everything. Uh, not sure if that actually fixed the issues prior on block production uh, pausing. Um, as part of this restart, the sidecar follower was not restarted. Um, and at least my impression was that the um, once the newly reset chain becomes longer than the previous state, the follower would automatically detect this and kind of switch over. Um, I don't know if that's the right assumption, but that never happened regardless. Um, so at least again, like when I wrote this last night, Sidecar was still reporting a block height of 1128, which was kind of prior to the, the restart on um, Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern. And then uh, Sunday around 5 p.m. Eastern, I think Jude mentioned, uh, Noted that the Bitcoin node itself was unresponsive. Um, things, even things were failing with HTTP 405, you know, which is sort of a method not found error. So could have suggested a firewall issue. And also that the miner was not driving any Bitcoin blocks um, and we were stuck at the burn chain block height of 11,720. Um, I don't know, again, as a team, if we, if we know yet exactly what happened. And then yesterday um, evening or late night, Jude again mentioned that, you know, there's likely some issues in the P2P firewall um, and then around 1.30 a.m. Eastern, Jude pushed some fixes or said that there are some fixes um, that we should deploy. So, so that's kind of the state um, that I was able to capture. Let me pause here, see if that makes sense if I mischaracterized or miscaptured anything or if that is mostly accurate. Jude, we can't hear you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Um, I had a question just about the sidecar. Um, did you 
have we checked the follower node? Do we know if the follower node is synchronized with the, the miner? I, I have not checked uh, the follower node, but I think the logs should all be um, in Kibana so we can we can take a look. Um, let me just write down. Um, so independent of that, but in terms of like things that happened, am I missing anything or this is roughly the sequence of events that people kind of observed? Uh, maybe just also a minor update. I. Um... I noticed that the system was stuck at block 11720 um, for some time, like for over 24 hours. So I don't know if that's adequately captured here, but it's definitely been the case that it hasn't moved at all. Wait, yeah. so is that the, the Bitcoin um, chain didn't progress past 11720? That's correct. Um, I also followed the logs and it's not, it's having a, it's having a hard time even contacting the Bitcoin node. It's getting timeouts. It's getting uh, pipe failures. Like you know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess there's something that's slowing down the Bitcoin node. The Bitcoin node is is live though. Like you can you can uh, follow its debug log. It's doing stuff. Um, that's why I suspected it was a firewall issue. If yeah, if it's yeah. the case that the neon miner node is connected to the Bitcoin node via the P2P firewall. Um, for the for the, the firewall, all it's doing is like JSON um, RPC call filtering, right? No, it's uh, it's also doing peer-to-peer -peer, uh, binary wire format message filtering. Um, the bugs that I pushed fixed two things. Um, first, there was a socket leak error, and we noticed that by looking at the open sockets in slash proc, um, that has since been remedied. Um, there was also, I think, a uh, message starvation error where we weren't catching all the edge triggers that was leading to some, like it would it'd be possible you could open a connection and then just never hear back. Um, all right, so, so coming back to this, I think before we jump into figuring out what happened, um, I think we should just come with sort of, you know, which are the pieces that we want to dig into and who's doing what. So at least like current state right now, given that we haven't yet deployed um, Jude's fixes, uh, the current state is the neon miner is not mining and it's still stuck at this uh, burn chain block height of 11,720. And the sidecar follower has still not detected um, this new chain and so it's still on the previous chain. Um, so we're not producing any new blocks. Um, I think the faucet is likely down as well, at least when I had checked. Uh, there were some connection issues. I think the faucet was taking, uh, or at least the sidecar endpoint for the faucet was taking forever to load. I think it timed out on me after a, a couple of minutes. Um, so, so I think at this point we should just uh, maybe uh, figure out like who wants to spend investigating which part of this puzzle because I think there are multiple pieces. Unless like there is a strong hypothesis. I think Jude, you mentioned that you know, P2P firewall might be suspect, like in your mind, is there a sequence of events with the P2P firewall, uh, with the fixes that you made that would explain like the rest of the, the state of the system? If it's the case that the miner is talking to, like the neon master node, I should say, is talking to the Bitcoin node via the firewall, then it's possible the firewall is starving it and that the Bitcoin node isn't even getting any of the wire format messages or vice versa. Um, that would explain um, timeouts we see when the, when it tries to synchronize with the burn chain. Um, if it can't synchronize with the burn chain, um, then I it wouldn't be picking up any key registers and thus wouldn't be picking up any block commits. Uh, it's less clear to me whether or not the um, JSON RPC queries against the Bitcoin node are getting through or not. Um, you would have to check the Bitcoin logs. But we can see it pretty easily if it's making new blocks. Because it could be that the that the node is um, actually no, I take it back. We know the Bitcoin chain is not advancing either. Uh, just doing a, a get blockchain info RPC on it will indicate that it's also stuck at one one seven two zero. So that needs to be investigated too. Um, yeah, but like the the sidecar follower node not picking up the new chain seems unrelated. It, well, there's. There's a couple things that could be going wrong there. Like it could be the case that the follower node is synchronized, but the, the sidecar is not. Like there could be some sort of disconnect there. 
Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Blocked. It, but it could also be the case that the follower is not synchronizing because the firewall is starving it too. I see. I was just about to check the uh, the logs um, right now. And for the neon master node, um, it, like, do we have uh, do we have a preference? Like, it should talk to the Bitcoin node through the firewall, or it should not talk through the Bitcoin node through the P two P firewall. It shouldn't need to. Um, the firewall is just there for external, like out, outside of our infrastructure connections, so that you can't just spin up another Bitcoin reg test node and reorg our chain. Yeah, Ludo, do you know how the how this is set up right now? Yeah, I just looked at the configuration, and um, it does use the P two P firewall. I see. Okay. So if you want to change that, mm -hmm. okay. Um, all right. Okay, so there's the sidecar issue to be debugged. Um, there's I'm just an I mean, update on to... that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the follower node is synchronized to burn chain height one zero seven two five, so it's definitely advanced. Um, it's not fully synced with the Bitcoin chain, which suggests to me it might be a, something in the firewall starving it. Um, okay. But the sidecar database um, and, it, and API is definitely out of sync with the follower node. Well, if the, it depends on what the burn chain height was previously, right? I mean, the yeah. sidecar. But you were saying earlier the sidecar was reporting a four digit block height, right? Like. That's the block head of the stacks chain. It reports the block head of the stacks chain. Oh, okay. Not the burn chain. So the eleven twenty eight is the stack head of the the stacks blockchain as viewed by the sidecar. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, I know that the um, I'll follow up with the DevOps team separately, but they have um, at least a PR in flight to. Uh, replicate the neon setup um, onto to Kubernetes and whatever we're kind of discussing here, I think it would make sense to just port over those changes there and migrate to to that setup as soon as we can. Uh, I think a lot of the, or at least some of the the symptoms that we see um, at least would be easier to manage once we are um, in a Kubernetes environment than the setup we have right now where, you know, we're a lot of, there's like a lot of manual kind of orchestration of things that, that ends up being uh, being needed. So I can relay at least some of the changes that we are discussing here to that team. Um, the other kind of big question I had for this group was, um, you know, there are these issues from the weekend that we need to diagnose. Um, and then we still have some in-flight PRs, uh, spe uh, specifically Ludo's PR for kind of graceful termination when you reach a specific block height. Um, Outside of that PR, um, and depending on what action items we generate from these issues, it's not clear to me right now, like, you know, which, which of these uh, should we consider blocking or delaying argon for. Um, on the one hand, you know, we, we don't yet have a setup where, you know, we have a long lived testnet that we can point the explorer to um, and, and poke it around. So, and if we want to stick to the the uh, 10K block height um, bar, you know, we're nowhere near that. Uh, you know, maybe we reached one to 2,000 stacks blockchain height, but, but that's really it. So if you want to really stick to that, you know, there's just no way. Um, and then, but on the other hand, right now it's not clear to me like what specific things we have identified uh, that would help us move um, to that block height. So, so I just wanted to uh, hear from folks, um, you know, reactions and and suggestions on, on what we should focus on. <clears throat> from, from my perspective, this seems to be like a debugging process where like if we're trying to get to whatever block limit that we want to get to um, for Argon, um, like if we want to get to like one week um period without hiccups like we will debug problems as they occur mm -hmm. sort of like there's still investigation work that needs to happen here yeah um 
And the way that I'm sort of viewing Argon is that there's no like new feature really that is like coming live with Argon, but really we're just like trying to make some sort of claim about the stability. Mm -hmm. Like Argon is now more stable than Neon mm -hmm. um, and we shouldn't like try to force ourselves to declare that before we've actually achieved uh, or are happy with the level of stability. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. Anyone else care to chime in? Sorry, go ahead, Jude. Um, considering our, our release goals for Krypton, uh, which will contain the first iteration of POX, I think it's going to be very important that everything else is as stable as we can make it. Because mm -hmm. uh, POX is probably going to have its own uh, set, of, set of concerns we'll have to deal with. And I'd rather be contending with just those issues as opposed to those issues on top of everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and how many of the issues over the weekend, you know, it feels like some of them are just artifacts of our infrastructure and less so about, you know, actual bugs uh, necessarily in the system, you know, whether it's for example, like the P2P firewall, like once we transition to the, the actual Bitcoin testnet, like that's just this component that we likely won't need anymore, right? Um, and same thing with, again, like the Fluent CPU usage, right now it feels a little bit of a red herring, like we don't have a clear kind of hypothesis or root cause for, was that a problem? Exactly what problems was it causing? And, and what have we fixed or made worse by, you know, putting some CPU limits on it? Uh, and, and that logging architecture will, will also likely change. So, um, so do, do people have a sense of, you know, are there suspected like real bugs um, uh, that we, we think we'll find here or are there more kind of uh, fine tuning our infrastructure, you know, both of which are, are important. Um, and I guess if we, maybe we won't know until we, we spend some more time like investigating. Um, yeah. I'm not sure there's a really a distinction there, like, if 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 our if it's all due to infrastructure configuration problems, it's still just as broken as if it would be if there were bugs in the code. So we're going to have to fix it either way. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, cool. So what I'm hearing is that uh, you know we should uh, try to get and still meet our stability goals, um, and there's no doesn't make sense to kind of. Uh, uh, get into Argon until we are satisfied with the level of reliability we have, which currently we are not. Is that a fair characterization? I don't want to post to that. No. Okay, so with that, let's come back to um, our board here. There were a bunch of new issues that came in over the weekend as well, so we'll, we'll review those. Um, so first, let's just go through the review column. Uh, I think this was merged, right, Jude? Yep, it's merged. Okay, close this off. Um, this was merged too, Aaron, or is it still in review? Um, it's still in review. Um, okay. I think its status is just that we want to make sure that like Matt has sort of signed off on it because it is going to be a breaking change. Um, because yeah, it changes the, the event JSON structure yeah okay um 1576 ludo i know you put this pr out but you mentioned that this pr is not ready for review yet right and it's just like yeah. a draft pr yeah i still need to uh, clean my work but uh yeah can you just summarize like what was the what was the problem here and what the solution is uh sure so uh, I think there was several issues, um, but yeah, so the main one uh, was coming from the fact that uh, when you um, restart a mocknet node, uh, it was not trying to retrieve the state of the current burn chain with all the operations that had been previously committed meaning we were not loading the VRF keys, the block updates from the previous block and so on. Uh, so yeah, so the main thing was to, yeah, load the previous, like use the previous state and um, initiate the, the, the burn chain with, with that. 
Um, is this, um, I guess like maybe switching tracks a little bit and I'll come back to, to the issues here in a second. Um, but going back to some of these reliability issues, um, at least in my mind, one of the um, sort of confounding factors right now is that any neon restart ends up resetting the stacks chain. So it's impossible for us to like ingest any kind of fixes or improvements without like going through this, like what feels like a very heavy process of, you know, resetting the stacks chain itself. Do other people feel this is a problem? Like, and, and do we have like, and at least in my mind, you know, if like the working directory stuff was working fine and we were confident in that, like there should be a way for us to upgrade the, you know, the software without resetting the chain. And is that something that we should attempt to fix um, in the near term? Like, do we feel like that will unblock our ability to at least, you know, move faster a little bit in, in incorporating some of the fixes without going through this chain reset process each time? I think it will depend on what's being fixed. Like if you're just, for example, upgrading the way the peer network behaves, then absolutely, you can just restart the node in place and it should just pick up where it left off. But yeah. if you're correcting something like the structure of the MARF being wrong, um, that's effectively a hard fork and you would need to do no, it. No, I understand. And my point is that right now we don't have that ability. Like it's, it's just all a big hammer, right? Like even if the process restarts for some arbitrary reason, it will effectively do a chain reset. Yeah, I, I agree that we should have two reset modes, like a soft reset and a hard reset. And we just picked whichever one's appropriate for the fix that we're trying to deploy. Right, is this a, even a reset at all? I think that this is like a, the ability to stop and start a node without any form of reset. Like mm -hmm. it's just using the same chain state. Sure, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah ability to stop and start would, would work just as well, yeah. But we don't currently have that ability, right? Correct. And um, is that related to this issue? Like, is that related to like making the working directory piece more robust? Uh, Sounds like it. Yeah. But this, so I haven't run uh, a neon node with uh, those fixes. I, I'm suspecting that uh, some work is required for. Uh, Allowing a new nut to do that, but yeah. Okay, so should we file a separate issue for you know allowing a graceful, like for for graceful termination and and restart? You, you know we should be pick up, we should be able to pick up, and reuse the chain state, right? Like that's and that will give us the ability to do like an in place software upgrade that doesn't touch you know the on disk state at all. If it's like picking up fixes or improvements uh, that are unrelated, we should be able to do that. Mm -hmm that mechanism reliably work. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, coming back to some of the in progress work items. I'm guessing Jude, these are still all in progress. Yep. Um, in fact, the latter three are blocked on a new issue um, that we can move into in progress when we get to it. Okay. Um, and all of these still in the backlog. Okay. Yep. And then uh, there are two new issues here. I think this is from the DevX team. Um, so, so the use case here is that, you know, we want to be able to see transactions as soon as, uh, they're submitted. Um, and we, I mean, from the DevX team perspective, this is pretty important usability improvement. Um, I think we had briefly talked about this, um, in terms of like scope of work and, and so on, but no one's actively working on this just yet. So I'll move this in the backlog, um, and we can kind of talk through. Uh, the rest of the stuff. Is this the one that you were talking about, Jude? Um, no, I'm sorry. I think it's not tagged yet. Um, That's just fine. Backlog, though. Um, is this something that we're targeting for the remainder of the sprint? Um, sure, if time permits. Um, but I don't think addressing it is going to materially improve anything. It's it's more of a crash consistency issue. 
let's see. Okay, so this is not like a, a something that's blocking or impacting us right now. All right, let's go through some of the new issues. Um, so there are several clarity related issues uh, that came up. So let's quickly go through those if folks have any opinions. Um, so this one is around variadic operators. I don't know if Aaron or, or Ludo, if you have any thoughts on this. Um, Sorry, it seemed, yeah, it, it seems okay. I think that, like before supporting this, we would want to just like do a sort of survey of some other Lisp languages um, because like variadic operations on comparisons are pretty strange. <laughs> like, I think like, they're just like unusual. Like it, it's not truly variadic. Like you couldn't have yeah. um, like up to n uh, arguments here. Yeah. I was about to say the same thing. When it comes to comparison operators, like if the uh, act of evaluating one of the operands mutates state, it's unclear whether or not you call it once or you call it each time it's pulled up for the comparison, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. And then this actually should be unnecessary. I, I like just replied to this. Like it should already be the case that if you do define read only, that it's callable from other read only contexts in mm -hmm. other contracts. Um, if it's not the case, it's a bug. Um, okay. So. Um, Aaron, related to this, do we have some notion of something like try read only? Um, reason being like maybe sometimes we know that a method will not mutate state, um, or maybe you know after the fact a method won't ever mutate state, and there's not really a way to expose that method via, say, the RPC interface. Do you think maybe that was kind of what Friedger was getting at? Um, hmm. Maybe. I would need to think um, more about that. Um, because currently, like, the way that read-only is enforced is sort of statically. Like, yeah. we do, it would be, it, it would be possible to um, do a dynamic check for read-onlyness, um, but it, it would involve some trickiness, um, because, like, basically it would just be reading that edit log and see if any changes occurred. You might also be able to infer read-only, like, even if you didn't define a function as read-only, it might actually not be. Oh, yeah. So um, the read only checker does this um, for um, private functions, um, but not for contract calls. So we, we could do that inference for contract calls. Um, it would just make um, the valuation of contract calls a little bit more expensive. All right, moving on, 1626. Yeah. Um, so I was gonna respond to this as well. Um, this is uh, not possible as described um, because um, like constants in Clarity are evaluated at runtime. Um, so like, you know, this contract address could actually like this constant X token, um, could have come from calling a different contract or whatever, um, like define constants evaluated at the time that the, um, contract itself is published. Um, which means that the type checker wouldn't be able to check that, uh, contract calls were, um, uh, statically correct. Um, we could do something like support for macros, um, which would allow people to write structures like this, but that would be it's sort of a different feature. Yeah. I mean, this also seems like this is like a purely convenience feature, right? Like there is, we're trying to. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So are you going to uh, add a comment here, Aaron? Otherwise, I, I'll, yeah. I can make a note. 
Yeah, we will. Okay. Yeah, I'll comment on it. Um, okay, this is an issue about function ordering. Is there a bug here or is it just expected behavior? Um, this, um, yeah, this, this should, I don't know, I, I would have to look into this because we okay. should be uh, order agnostic for function orders. Okay. All right, so, so you'll take a look at this one as well. I'll just do an update of whether it's a bug or expected behavior. Okay, this is a thing request uh, came in from Friedger. Hmm. You have any thoughts on this one? I, I think we should have such a function. Okay. Do we want to have it for each um, <laughs> buffer up to 16 bytes? Yeah, I think so. Um, all right. Mark and panic after submitting a transaction. Has anyone had a chance to look through this one? I can take a look. All right. Hmm. Right. Uh, best guess is that there's something in, it's probably a bug in the, in the way we handle. Um, uh, we're probably not checking balances when we're mining transactions is my best guess, but I mean, I'll take a look. Don't know okay. for sure. Either. All right. Um, and if you do determine it's um, a bug, Jude, feel free to uh, tag it to the, the current sprint. Um, all right, more clarity stuff. Oh, I think this this came up um, in the context of some other discussion that I saw uh, either on Discord or, or maybe another issue in a different repo, uh, maybe here. Oh, that's right. So, Uh, like this, this is the issue, I think. So function names that contain a question mark. Read only RPC calls for those fail. Is this purely a tooling issue or is there an actual fix in the behavior at the blockchain level? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't see, be surprised um, if this was a bug in the RPC, um, if, it, if it wasn't handling escape characters correctly. Yeah. We should be able to test this within the, at least the blockchain layer pretty easily, yes. right? If two. Yeah, yeah. So let's at least test that, and then we can update the bug. Um, OK. Jude, where is the issue that you were talking about? Am I missing it here? It's uh, 16, 17. Okay, why don't we come to that and then I'll go back to some of these. Okay, you wanna just quickly refresh everyone on, on what this issue is? Sure, the TLDR is that when we have micro blocks coming in before they're confirmed by a subsequent anchored block, we need to be able to present the materialized view of the chain as if those micro blocks were applied. Um, this is necessary both for mining. Um, so if I'm in the process of mining my micro blocks, I need to be able to see what the chain state is so I can validate subsequent transactions. Um, it's also the case for anyone who's running a node and needs to see um, what the current state of the world is before they send another unconfirmed transaction. Uh, for example, if I send a sequence of transactions that all um, spend from my the same account, um, I need to be able to know my current nonce, my current balances are. 
and that it's dependent on me knowing what the effects of, of applying the last sequence of microblocks against the last confirmed anchored block uh, materialized to. And you were saying that um, this is blocking the three other issues that you currently have working on. Yeah, it's making it harder to produce a miner. Okay. But once applied, um, producing a miner should become a lot simpler. And then Aaron and I were going back and forth about how exactly to do this. So you guys, you guys, have you guys sort of converge on a plan of action that is seems reasonable, or is there still some discussion to be had? No, I, I, think, I think Aaron's right here. Uh, we should really only concern ourselves with building just the materialized view of unconfirmed microblocks off the canonical chain tip, and not try to do it for non-canonical chain tips. Um, is it worth uh, going through this in the um, the design meeting tomorrow? Um, or, no, I, think, or... I think we're pretty good. I think the only thing that I would even need to bring up on this still is just the exact tactics of how we're going to do this. Um, but I don't think they materially matter um, with the design. Okay. So um, should I add this to the sprint, Jude, if you're actively working on this one? Yeah, it goes along with the mining PR. Um, and just in terms of prioritization, like at least um, in my mind, like the, the, the mining PRs that you're working on, like they will enable like the production of like this minor CLI and, you know, minor artifact that we have talked about in the past. Um, but if we are, you know, if there are other sort of reliability issues that we're working on for Argon, we should probably go over those first um, and then come back to these because these are not argon blockers, right? Just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to prioritization. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Okay. Yeah, though, I, I mean, I would say that like this is fairly high priority just because we want to start testing the actual client behavior of microblocks probably sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah, we would ship this before POX with all in all likelihood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we went through this one. Um, all right, so let's come back to, all right, inconsistent behavior when using a trait parameter. I think maybe Aaron just should just make through a pass of all clarity issues. <laughs> And just pick the ones <laughs> that uh, are, are bugs yeah. or, or need addressing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I will. Okay. I will do a pass. Uh, okay. Yeah. After this meeting. All, all right. Sounds good. Um, okay. So I'm going to skip over these. Uh, this is. I'm guessing we'll just merge this PR, right? There's no change here, right, Ludo? Just deleting a bunch of old files. Correct. Okay. Um, any other issues worth talking through? Um, that's going to be part of the next of the, the mining PR. That's just some refactoring work. I see. Okay. And then, uh, this is, uh, something that we discussed like tail end of the last week. Um, is there like a clear next step on this one? I know we fix like the one of the related issues, right? 16, 14 or 16, 16. Yeah, I mean, that was like, that's more like, a, uh, that was like a surface level fix. Um, I think um, the next step is figuring out whether or not we, add, we, we need to expire used VRF keys um, because if we don't, then we don't need to solve this problem. Um, if we do, then uh, we've got to pick one of these two strategies, um, neither of which are that fun. Um, so how, then, how do we get to a decision on that? Well, I, I think the decision hinges on um, how safe would it be if we allowed miners to reuse their VRF proving keys? Like, does it 
does it give them an advantage to be able to do so that would be uh, undue? Or is it, is it, does it lead to uh, minors shooting themselves in the foot? I think we just need to, th to talk through this. Okay. Yeah. This might be a good topic for the design. Uh, All right. Yeah. Let's, let's add it to the doc. And then, uh, yeah, we can also discuss the possible uh, ramifications of this sort of same validation of spent UTXOs to uh, stacking transactions. Because mm -hmm. I think it's relevant there too. All right, let's pick it up tomorrow then. Uh, this is a relatively easy, I don't think it's a blocker, but uh, a, a configuration nicety that I think would help the DevOps team here, presumably other people as well. Uh, basically just instead of having, uh, you know, uh, peer sort of host and two port settings, uh, just have a host port setting for each of the, you know, either RPC or, or P2P. Um, so instead of having this, just have two host ports that we can consistently use. Um, So I don't think, I think this is urgent, uh, but might be like a good first issue for folks to tackle if someone's interested. Should I add that label? Is anyone opposed to that? Um, yeah, it should be fine. It's, it's, it's going to touch several different files though, I think. And it may yeah. not be obvious uh, which ones. Yeah, so, it so, could be like a 180 line PR. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like it's more than just adding the config fields. You got to make sure that the config values get passed to the right modules. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that it, it might be a bad first PR. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Look, it's a potential potential first issue, but not necessarily a good one. <laughs> yes, it's like uh, first it's foot gun, <laughs> third PR. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, if, if we decided that the stacks minor node should not be talking to Bitcoin through the firewall, I think that alleviates the develop the deployment concern that brought this issue up. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. I think oh, this is just your PR. I should move this to. Um, all right. Have we gone through all of these? What about this one? Um, kind of related yeah. to the follower discussion. The first half of this will be implemented in my upcoming minor PR. Um, it's really just adding a couple more fields to V2 info. Uh, the other half of this is making it so that the follower node, if it realizes it's part of a test net, uh, just periodically checks V2 info and sees whether or not the master uh, has uh, restarted or like yeah. has started up with a different view. Don't we, didn't we also ask, create an issue to add more fields to V2 info? Like are you planning to just pull out that patch uh, separately or is it gonna be part of your bigger PR? Um, I think it's it's currently part of the bigger PR now, but I can separate it out. It's not important. Yeah, I think that might that might that might be helpful just to address the V because I, I agree there is a lot more kind of useful things that we can probably include in there. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Yeah, I think like uh, more info in V2 info, it's just like good all the time right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I think we, and this is, I guess, similar to So Ludo, is there, do you, you feel like we, you can evolve this PR to address the other thing that we were talking about, like ability to pause and resume, not just on Mockin, but on Neon as well? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's it for the board. 
Well, wait, isn't that issue closed? Um, In the, this data? Sorry. 1608, I thought, is already merged. Uh, no, I think it's it's still open. 1608 is 1609 are both in that PR with the uh, that changes the events. Uh, okay. Um, but we'll close it when the PR merges then. Yep. Okay. So all right. So we talked through this. Um, I think Matt got the follower logs on Slack. So hopefully we can take a look at those um, afterwards. Um, so, so just to uh, have a plan of action here, I think we need to redeploy the P2B firewall. We'll update uh, the settings so that the Neon master does not go through the firewall to talk to the Bitcoin node um, and can, can talk to directly. Um, we still need to investigate what happened with the follower and if there is like a specific action item from that. Jude, can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. Um, and then Aaron is gonna make a pass through all of the issues that came in around clarity and, and see if there's anything that needs to be addressed immediately. Otherwise I suspect that most of them will either you know address later or maybe are, are not bugs. Um, and then uh, I'm going to um, coordinate with the, the rest of the teams uh, around Argon launch. It's, you know, I think it's safe to say that we, there's no way we feel comfortable launching tomorrow. We wanna hit, um, you know, get to a better state in terms of reliability. Um, my preference, and if someone has an objection or a better idea, let me know, but my preference would be to transition over to the Kubernetes setup um, ASAP, uh, because that's our sort of longer term setup. I don't think it makes sense to spend time debugging and fine tuning the, the VM that we have right now. It's, it's pretty brittle as is. Um, so I don't wanna add more complexity there. So if that works for everyone, um, uh, let's move to that transition um, and we update the P2P firewall. Like, are there any other kind of known things that we want to incorporate before uh, you know, we start this, uh, the, the setup on Kubernetes that we wanna have in place and that we think will help and improve the reliability or are there any other blocking issues that we should try to fix first? No. Um, then I think one of the higher leverage things is um, if we can get to a point where we can stop and start uh, without resetting, I think that would help uh, quite a bit at least in some of the, the scenarios. So, so we'll, uh, we'll continue working on that. Um, in terms of, I mean, given that we, we don't really have um, good understanding of what happened or, you know, what would take to fix some of these issues, I suspect that um, once we spend some time looking into this, hopefully we'll have, uh, you know, some actual like more concrete bugs that we can work with in terms of time estimates. Um, absent that, do people have a sense of, you know, how much more time do we need to get to a more stable state or like when is the next checkpoint we should look at? Um, should it be like end of the week? Um, should it be sometime next week? Um, I think like the stability goal is like, uptime of like five days, right? Or something like that, right? I mean, yeah, if the block production holds up, then we should get to around 10,000 blocks in three and a half days. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, but like that, that to me seems like it implies a timeline. Yeah, uh, but I guess like the, the question in my mind was that, you know, let's say we restarted the chain today on this new setup. Yeah. Um, are there like already like known things that we have reason to believe that should improve the, the uptime that we were able to reach last time. If so, then maybe we should wait to incorporate those before we, uh, you know, start that, that block. Uh, so I guess like that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, are there known things that we should hold off on before we start uh, this process? And at least right now, right. the answer to me is no. Well, Unless, wait, like, do, do we, we want to have the uh, transaction receipt PR merged first? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, I would say also the P2P firewall changes. Like there's 
all of this stuff that we discussed here is stuff that we would want addressed before we started the class, right? Uh, yeah, although like for some of those, for example, you know, fluent CPU consumption, I don't know. You know oh, what? sure, sure. Yeah, I, I'm not even sure <laughs> if like fluent CPU consumption, like I, I agree with you that I think that it might be a red herring. Yeah. Or like the sidecar follower, you know, once we look at the logs, like maybe there'll be a, a concrete uh, task there. But right now I don't know if there's like anything that is necessarily blocking. Okay, how about this? I think there's like a few concrete changes here that we already know. We'll let's try to incorporate yep. that. If there are other things that come up, like as people go through some of these issues and investigate, you know, like the the panic on transaction submission that that Friedger, I think, filed that you, you, you were going to look at. If we uncover like things that we should hold off on on restarting the clock, just ping me and and I can incorporate those in the timeline. Uh, <clears throat> question, Sh should we have an action item for the fact that the pace um, of block production is slower than expected? Uh, I, I think it's something that needs to be investigated, yeah. Yeah, I think part of the problem maybe is that like, we haven't had, um, okay, let me see what I'm gonna say. In theory, Ludo, we should actually have logs from Thursday through Saturday morning where we were producing blogs at um, some cadence that you should be able to to look at. I guess like my question is, um, you know, for with a block interval of 30 seconds, like there are other things that are happening in the system as well. So, I mean, in steady state, what is the expectation? Is it that block production should, you know, be like approximately be, you know, 120 blocks per minute? Uh, is there like some normal uh, error bars around that number that would be expected in steady state? Um, I at least don't have a good sense of that. If people do, um, please chime in. Uh, because otherwise, like, you know, we, we might be looking for something that I don't know, like we might still have uh, the block production problem because like so many things will change between now and like, let's say the next phase of the test net. Like, is this something that we should set up a target for what the block production should look like and, and investigate it once we have a stable setup? Um, or is this something that it's part of, uh, you know, the, the getting to a more stable state to begin with? Otherwise, I mean, the logs are there. We can file an issue and then we can, we can do that debugging right now. We should be producing blocks at approximately the same rate as Bitcoin blocks. Like when you run the system locally with a Bitcoin reg test node with the miner, that's what happens. Um, the fact that that's not happening in production is definitely worth investigating. Okay, let's just do it then. All right. So Ludo, can you file this issue? Sure. Um, I again suspect that that might be due to the firewall um, because the firewall, if it's sit being sitting, being the fact that right now it sits between the miner and the Bitcoin node, like that can do um, untold damage to its ability to uh, produce blocks or its inability to produce blocks. So we should definitely investigate its yeah. behavior in the absence of the firewall. So that actually brings, uh, that's a good point, Jude. I, and I thought to discuss this, but I didn't. Right now, uh, you know, the P2P firewall is something that Jude wrote. Thank you, Jude. Uh, but I feel like most of the team doesn't really have context on this. Um, and, you know, we're not going through our processes that we would do for other repositories in terms of like code reviews or tests. Like, would it be useful to maybe do like an initial code walkthrough? So we have a little bit more eyes, a little bit more shared context, and we can actually start doing code reviews as well. Like if we think that this is, this will remain, you know, like a somewhat critical component of the infrastructure deployment until we transition to the Bitcoin testnet in phase four. You know, it seems like we have quite some time while we'll still depend on, on this component. Sure, I'm down to do that. Okay, should we fold it into the meeting tomorrow then if we have time, depending on how many other topics we have? Yeah, that's, that, it's, not that, it's not a very big piece of code. It's only about a thousand lines or so, including okay. comments in white space. All right, let's, let's do that then. All right, we just have a few minutes left here. Any other topics worth discussing? Are there any questions from the community? That's right, sorry folks, we've been 
uh, very inward focused uh, for this meeting. And I think our folks, if they have questions afterwards too, we can always um, take them in Discord. I know that this is a pretty uh, packed meeting as is, so um, I, I thank the folks for joining us, but uh, if they wanna chime in in Discord, I know a number of the engineers here are there. <laughs> 